Listening to the Coffee Hour, I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Friday morning. It is May, May first. Happy May. Happy May. Happy May Day. <laughs> it is. Uh, it's a new month, and I think it's, it's it's May. So we'll go with that. That means a lot of things happen in May. <laughs> this is true. Typically, what uh, Mother's Day, lots of graduations, things like that. Um, mm-hmm. But what's you know we're finishing up a school year. What does this mean for um, for education, and particularly for like seminarians? What does this mean for them? Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm excited to talk with uh, our good friend Professor John Pless here in just a moment from Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. Thanks to Concordia Seminary, I'm Concordia University, Wisconsin. <laughs> So many Concordias. Happy um, May. But we are so thankful for Concordia in Wisconsin. Concordia University, Wisconsin, uh, is, is underwriter of the Coffee Hour, and we're so grateful for your support. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Joining us by phone this morning, Professor John Pless, Director of Field Education at Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne. Good morning, Professor Pless. Hey, good morning. Good to be with you. Oh, it's always good to hear your voice and to, to have some time to chat with you and and uh, you're usually quite the traveling man, and uh, I, I guess grounded for a little while. It sounds like. Yeah, this I think yeah, I've been teaching at Fort Wayne for 20 years, and I think this is the longest uh, span <laughs> that I have not left campus to go someplace else, so uh, either across the country or uh, to other parts of the world. So yeah, I'm kind of grounded right now. <laughs> what is oh, Professor Plus? What is seminary field education? And, and, and how is it important yeah. to the formation of, of pastors and church workers? Yeah, field education is um, an important component in the formation of future pastors. Uh, all of our students are assigned uh, to a congregation in the greater Fort Wayne area, uh, first quarter of their first year, and uh, they remain in that congregation for two years. And um, it really does kind of prep them for Vicarage, Vicarage, uh, which is a kind of internship full time uh, where they are located in a parish that might be quite distant from Fort Wayne and work under the supervision and tutelage of a more seasoned, experienced pastor. Uh, Field education uh, really kind of is a prelude, a preliminary to the Vicarage experience. And we ask the students to spend typically around uh, five hours a week in the congregation. Uh, They start out slowly observing, uh, just kind of watching, getting to know pastor and congregation. And then things begin to ramp up as they participate as a liturgist, uh, maybe teaching a Sunday school class, confirmation class, shadowing the pastor as he does hospital calls or um, Um, visits to the shut-ins or visits to inactives, maybe being involved in the evangelism outreach of the congregation, Uh, shadowing pastors as he, um, uh, as he, um, you know, conducts funeral service, for example. Uh, So getting to learn by observation uh, all the things that will be required of one who's going to be um, a pastor. And then in addition to that uh, experience in the congregation, uh, students uh, meet with me in a plenary session for one hour, all the first-year students uh, on Monday morning for an hour and all the second-year students on uh, on Friday morning for an hour. So we're really working to integrate theology and practice, uh, to talk about uh, issues that may come up in the course of parish ministry and how to uh, face them with uh, biblical uh, integrity. Since so many congregations aren't actually meeting in person right now, how does that change, or how has that changed in the last couple of months, what field education actually looks like for these seminarians? Well, yeah, that's a great question, and uh, the changes have been uh, profound, to say uh, to say the least. Uh, you mentioned I travel a lot. I go to South Africa typically twice a year, and mm-hmm. I was wrapping up a teaching assignment at Lutheran Theological Seminary in Pretoria, South Africa, and on 
Friday, uh, March 13, and was flying back to the States that night. And just before boarding the plane, I heard from the seminary here that uh, all of our classes were migrating online and that um, the seminary was going into a, at that point, kind of a semi-lockdown mode. And it would certainly have implications for field education. I didn't realize how deep those implications would be until I got back in uh, in the United States. And um, as we uh, kind of assessed the situation and tried to figure out some strategies to keep students involved, but from a distance. And so I prepared a, um, a little protocol document, which I sent out to all the supervising pastors and students, and we kind of outlined some things that uh, students could do that um, at least for, you know, uh, this kind of season, which now has turned into a full academic quarter for us, uh, most of the congregations are not meeting. Uh, if they are meeting, they're meeting in small groups of no more than 10 people at a time to uh, comply with um, uh, health regulations in the state of Indiana. Uh, many of the congregations are doing, um, you know, streaming uh, their services or uh, providing a video of a recorded service. And uh, Bible classes sometimes are also being conducted that way. Pastors are trying to keep in touch with uh, uh, with congregants through um, social media, uh, through uh, some, you know, video chat and so forth. And so we uh, have encouraged the students to stay connected with the congregation, uh, even though it's from a distance, to watch what the pastor is doing and to really kind of take this in with the thought that uh, this may well indeed carry over uh, into their, uh, to the second year students, into their very rich uh, year, this, this coming year. Right. Then uh, for, the, uh, for the meetings um, on, uh, on Monday, uh, Friday mornings, uh, we have really kind of changed uh, the focus in many ways with the um, uh, first year students. They are meeting in small groups. They were, uh, already assigned to read the book by Gene Beef and Trevor Sutton on authentic Christianity, still doing that, but now uh, you know, using those theological categories to think about uh, what does this mean also for uh, Christian vocation and pastoral uh, ministry. With the second year uh, students, I'll be meeting with them, in fact, uh, by Google Hangout, just, as, uh, just after I get off the phone uh, with, with you folks, and we've had um, three guest speakers over the past three weeks. Uh, pastor Brian Wolfmiller, parish pastor, that many of your listeners know from Austin, Texas. Uh, Dr. Jacob Corzine, who's on the faculty at Concordia, Chicago. And uh, colloquy vicar uh, Joshua Miller uh, from, um, uh, from Roseville, Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Miller has actually written a book on... Um, from the absence, or not the absence of God, but the hiddenness of God and lament. And so we've used these three speakers to focus on kind of different pastoral responses uh, to the uh, uh, COVID-19 crises. Pastor Wolf Miller talked about this from his perspective of a parish pastor who is trying to figure out how to coordinate ministry uh, at St. Paul's uh, Lutheran Church in Austin, uh, Dr. Corzine, had written a blog post for the craft of preaching on preaching in time of pandemic. And so he worked with um, preaching and what is uh, is going to be kind of specific as the way the word of God is brought into this specific situation. And uh, Dr. Miller focused on uh, lament. How do we pray to God? How do we use the Psalms in particular in times when God is um, seems to be, uh, distant and removed, and we don't know really where to turn. Hmm. So it's been, uh, you know, it, it's it's really kind of, uh, for me, uh, provided a way of kind of refocusing what we do uh, on a typical basis. I mean, we're covering uh, in our classes things that could apply to a variety of crises, but now this uh, pandemic has brought a very sharp focus on to our work in the formation of pastors. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it, and you, you've brought up uh, quite a few really good points that I really <laughs> wish we had like two hours <laughs> to unpack there, what this means. What does this mean for pastors? In what ways are pastors part of the front line? We keep hearing about frontline workers, and there are mm-hmm. you know, many different vocations that are so key right now um, in terms of keeping people safe and, 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 and moving forward. In, in what ways are pastors part of that front line? And then we'll talk about well, how seminary education um, is part of that, too. I mean, there are again. We could we could go on uh, literally. I think for hours on some of these topics because uh, you know it's it's simply assumed if you're sick in the hospital, especially if you're near death, your pastor is going to be there. Can't happen right now. Mm-hmm. We pastors bear a terrible, heavy, uh, kind of grading cross in many cases. Um, that, that wears deeply at them of not being able to be at the bedside of a dying saint and knowing that that uh, beloved child of God is going to die alone, without family, uh, without loved ones, without the pastor, that he can only stand at a very far distance and pray. And, and, and then after death, how do you conduct a funeral? Hmm? Um, when uh, any kind of public gathering is limited to only maybe 10 uh, people, as it is here in um, Indiana, um, and and where uh, the whole congregation uh, cannot be kind of invoked uh, physically, at least to be present, stand around that grieving family, that there's only a quick to middle service uh, with uh, uh, the... Um, hope that there would be some kind of more public memorial service, you know, after restrictions are, are lifted. Uh, you know, the thought, again, just a few weeks ago, Easter Sunday, uh, the pastor not being able, in many cases, uh, to stand before the congregation, even a small congregation, and uh, proclaim the Easter gospel, having to do that uh, by by way of, uh, of, of Internet. And all the other kinds of challenges that uh, that that come up there, that the pastors uh, having to kind of retool himself uh, to minister in many ways uh, to people from uh, you know from a distance, and that's uh, kind of challenging and uncharted uh, uncharted territory, I think, for us. In many ways, both the students and the. the... The, the pastors that are mentoring them in this field education are, are learning alongside one another. We're talking with Professor John Pless, Director of Field Education at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, and uh, we have more to talk about uh, how this pandemic is impacting students and, and uh, seminarians and, and field education and their formation as well. We'll be right back in just a moment. You're listening to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. <laughs> When I look at the x-ray of your funny bone, it seems that everything is A-OK. Medical research has proven laughter helps you both emotionally and physically. Wrestling with the basics on Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. are on demand. We've been putting the fun in the fundamentals for over 30 years. Over 30 years? Oh, don't put too much strain on your funny bone. Nine out of ten doctors agree. It's less painful than getting a flu shot. I'm Oh, yuck. God doesn't have to figure out something about you that he doesn't already know. He doesn't have to figure out if he, if he loves you or if he's committed to you or if you're worth it. God's not testing you to figure something out about you he didn't already know. He's testing you so that you can figure out something about him that you didn't know. So that you can figure out that you can trust him. Dr. Michael Ziegler, this week on The Lutheran Hour. Sundays at 1230 and 5 p.m. on Worldwide KFUO. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. 
We're talking with Professor John Pless, Director of Field Education at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, we were talking about pastors being part of the front line and, and much of what they they can't do right now that's a part of their regular vocation, um, mm-hmm. caring for the, the sick and dying, providing that pastoral care. And, and for those, especially those who are um, for the families and the congregations of, of the, the saints who are or who've gone on and, and being able to conduct a funeral, what, what are they able to do in this time? And what does this mean for, uh, for seminarians who are learning from these pastors who are in field education? Uh, Professor Pless, right before we went to break, we were, I, I mentioned that you know, many of the, the pastors um, that are mentoring or, or teaching these field ed students um, are learning right alongside them of how to adapt to the, the circumstances of this pandemic. Would you like to respond to that? Yes. I, and in fact, this is a place where you really see kind of a wonderful back and forth between the uh, mentoring pastors and the students. Um, and many of our students are, of course, young and uh, more technologically savvy than their, uh, <laughs> their, their pastors who tend to be a bit older. And so in many cases, these students have been able to, uh, uh, help the pastor and congregation, uh, you know, uh, kind of access the technology that makes it available or, or, or that the congregation can use uh, to uh, stream a service or to uh, uh, provide for a Bible class online or a devotion. So that's been a, a kind of a, a kind of a nice aspect here of students actually being able to, to be of some service and help in, in the congregation as well. And one of the things that we've really encouraged the pastors and students to do is uh, through this pandemic uh, to continue talking to each other uh, so that uh, pastors are explaining to the students why they're doing what they're doing and how they're doing it. And uh, students are being prepped to ask, uh, to ask questions and, um, again, uh, really to kind of learn from the pastor. One of the um, words that we often use in field education, especially in the uh, first year of field education, is the student uh, shadowing the pastor. In other words, the student kind of standing in the background to look, look on and to observe. You can learn a lot that way, of course. And, um, and, and that's especially important now, even though this shadowing has to be done you know, virtually or, or from a distance. And, and and I'm I'm really happy with the way this is working out as I get reports back from both students and pastors. Pastors are finding ways uh, to keep students connected and involved. Um, pastors are uh, creating some opportunities uh, for field ed students to be involved in, uh, uh, in, in caring for people. For example, uh, one of our congregations here in Fort Wayne, uh, the pastor has assigned field ed students uh, to make telephone calls on all the um, elderly members of the congregation. So these members that uh, no longer can get kind of a face-to-face in-person visit uh, from a pastor or from a vicar, uh, they're now getting a, um, a telephone call each week, and the student just uh, you know kind of checks in with them, sees if there's anything that they need, uh, shares with them a scripture, a devotion, uh, and a prayer kind of a nice, creative uh, way of getting, you know, of getting students, uh, you know, involved and in learning how to do some of this from a distance. Um, I also teach a course here in catechetics, teaching catechism, and uh, we're having to do that course online. This is the first time I've ever uh, taught uh, online, and uh, particularly teaching a course like catechetics, where students are expected to do some kind of uh, teaching practicums in the in the, in, in the uh, presence of fellow students, they're learning to do that also online because it could well be that when uh, some of these students go in Vicarage next year, uh, they're going to be conducting catechism classes online or with Google Hangout or uh, you know some similar device. How might this experience shape pastors? For the future, I mean, you mentioned a few things of, of just these these on uh, on on hand learning experiences on on the fly as as they're going along <laughs> and, and learning next to their pastors. Uh, how how might all of this shape them 
in the whatever the the yeah. quote unquote new normal might be for us on the other side of this. Yeah. Um, one of the things we really emphasize in our field education from first quarter lectures, spending a lot of time with Luther's little triad, three Latin words, but, uh, you know, simple to understand, oratio, meditatio, tentatio. What makes a theologian? Prayer, meditation on the Word of God, and Contatio, which is kind of hard to translate, but spiritual attack. And that uh, now has really come alive. Students tell me that now they are kind of experientially uh, learning what oratio, prayer, meditatio, meditation, tentatio, spiritual attack, are all about as they're involved in congregations uh, with pastors. And, and so there's a... Um, a kind of a an edge, I think, in a very positive way, uh, that uh, helps actually students experience something that is clearly no longer simply a kind of a theoretical. Um, for many years in in teaching pastoral theology and field education, we lo- we looked at um, Luther's letters of spiritual counsel, letters that Luther wrote to people in a variety of circumstances grief, death, challenges that would come uh, with marriage or with anxiety or their own vocational uh, responsibilities. And in that collection is a, what has now become a very famous kind of piece in Luther's corpus of Luther's writing, his 1527 open letter to a pastor, John Hess, whether Christians may flee in plague time. And we had just studied that letter in class a um, quarter before this uh, you know, epidemic or pandemic came upon us. And now students are able to take that, you know, that uh, text nearly 500 years old and begin to apply some of Luther's insights. What Luther said that um, a pestilence uh, challenges uh, both faith and love, challenges faith. Can God be trusted even in the midst of sickness and death? And it challenges love. How are we going to respond? Uh, how are we going to um, be available for the neighbor, even this in this time when we are uh, kind of out of necessity, forced into social distancing? And, and so, again, students are... are um, kind of experientially uh, seeing the value of these things that they have been uh, uh, studying from the uh, from the scriptures, from the history of the church, and um, in this case, particularly from the work of, of, of Martin Luther. I, I really appreciate the the three themes that you brought up: oratio, meditatio, tentatio. I always have thought of the tentatio as a struggle or wrestle. Um, yeah, and, uh, and I think it's perhaps, especially in our very comfortable world, what was a very comfortable world here. Um, we, I don't know if we really, truly grasped what that that tentatio is, and I think we're starting to see it a bit more. We have just about three minutes left, but are mm-hmm. there are there themes in Scripture that you think in the past may have been overlooked, like this, you know, like you mentioned the the lesson that or the the writing of, of Luther about the plague, um, that that perhaps have been that we kind of glossed over before because oh that doesn't really apply to us now, but that perhaps would be particularly helpful in this time. Um, are there themes or, or or particular texts in Scripture that you think we've overlooked or glossed over, but now perhaps would be really helpful? I think particularly, and I've already mentioned this in passing, uh, the Psalms of Lament, uh, those Psalms that uh, seem to be pretty brutal sometimes. In fact, uh, on first first reading, you might even say they're almost blasphemous, uh, but they're really not. They're, they're, they're taking the worry, the frustration, uh, disappointment, anxiety, uh, all the questions uh, to God himself. You think of us you know, um, Good Friday Psalm, Psalm 22, Psalm 13. Uh, Some of these psalms that we 
often simply skip over there in in many cases not even in the uh l s b in the in the you know we have certain psalms there uh but many of these psalms are just kind of thought to be a little too raw i think but now we are rediscovering uh, that these psalms are really the vehicles that God has given his own word that now we can use to bring to bring our laments, uh, to bring our uh, questions, to bring our deep need and distress uh, into the very heart of God himself, as he has promised, uh, has promised there uh, to, to hear us. And, um, and, and so I think, uh, yes, this, um, you know, we, this tentatio, this struggle, this spiritual attack, actually does drive us back then to meditate on the Word of God, uh, to uh, cling to the Word of God. Um, and I'm particularly kind of fascinated here with uh, two parts of Holy Scripture that I've been working with these days uh, in relation to uh, uh, the pandemic. Psalms would certainly be one, uh, but also the first epistle of Peter, which in many of the churches is actually being read uh, kind of lectio continua or continuous lectionary uh, during this Easter season. Uh, that um, uh, here we have hope uh, in in First Peter. We have hope in suffering. Uh, we have joy in the midst of tribulation, and by the comfort of the Holy Scriptures. Uh, we are given the sure and certain knowledge that Jesus is Lord and that even this virus uh, will not separate us from uh, from him. And uh, under the pressure of that suffering, God is still turning us inside out so that we might be of some earthly use also uh, to the neighbor in our particular uh, callings and vocation. Amen, amen. Professor John mm-hmm. Pless, Director of Field Education, Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Thank you so much for being our guest today, Professor Pless. Great to be with you. Glad to be with you at, at any time. And uh, stay safe and the Lord's blessings with you as we uh, uh, press forward, okay? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.